I'm driving a truck. Boom, boom, diesel. Is that what is parked outside? Yes. <laughs> wow, I have to go take a look at it. There is something beyond what you know that's very important. Yes, exactly. So that's 40. <laughs> so anybody could be a mystic. Of course. Wow. Do you have any last words of wisdom? I'm going to live for some more time. Where do you want me to tell the last words right now? <laughs> <laughs>
So, uh, when the report card comes, I just take it and give it to my father. Every time he sees, he just blows up. I don't know what nasty things they're writing to him, but I never bothered to open and see because I thought this is a transaction between my teacher and my father. I had no business in that <laughs> because I first of all did not know why the hell I was in a school and why was I going there. I never understood. <laughs> Nobody... <laughs> <laughs> Nobody made me understand why I have to go to school. I found, you know, like when I was uh, just three and a half years of age, they started sending me to this uh, kind of a baby school, all right? So this uh, housemaid uh, walks me down, I, I made a deal with her, you leave me at the gate. She wants me to leave me in the classroom, which I don't like. She left me at the gate and once you enter the gate, you can't come out. So I just loiter around, then as soon as she disappears, I disappear somewhere. I'm just three and a half, and I found the Grand Canyon in India. And there I went and did all my scientific experiments. I... my father was a physician, I emptied lots of bottles which were at home and caught tadpoles, all kinds of insects, this, that, I was making a scientific study. But after three and a half months, they caught me and said that I was playing in a gutter. Oh, it was... <laughs> <laughs> it was a huge Grand Canyon in my experience, and it was full of life <laughs> Oh, wow! <laughs> so, I somehow moved on. This happened <laughs> about fifteen years ago. Uh, this school where I studied over forty-seven, forty-eight years ago, they came and they said, uh, this is our hundred and twenty-fifth anniversary of the school, you must come and speak. I said, see, I was not just a not good student, I was not even a student. Because I came there only when it was a must, otherwise I was gone somewhere. They said, no, no, <laughs> our school has produced uh, federal ministers, our school has produced film stars, our school has produced cricketing stars, in India cricketing stars are very big. But you are the only mystic, you must come <laughs> So I went <laughs> So I went and stood up in the quadrangle of the school to speak. I looked around, same oppressive buildings. And then I looked at this classroom and I suddenly remembered what happened there. I was twelve years of age. And uh, those days, I barely spoke. Because when you don't know anything, what do you say? I'm still trying to drink in life, what is there to say? I'm paying attention to the world to at least have some grasp of what it is. So, uh, this man is asking some question. Initially, I look at them, I see their form, and I hear their voice, but I don't understand their words, I just hear sounds. Because people are coming and making sounds, this is what I saw in the school, it's teacher after teacher, they come and make sounds, make sounds, make sounds, because I realized, that, see right now I'm talking, actually I'm making only sounds. Suppose I start talking in one of the Indian languages that you don't understand, you have no clue about. As far as you're concerned, I'm just making sounds, isn't it? So I realized it's me who is making up the meanings in my head, they're just making sounds. So I stopped making meaning in my head, I just looked at them and they went on making sounds, and it looked so amusing, so a big <laughs> smile spread on my face <laughs> But they were not amused <laughs> <laughs> right, right. They were not amused at all. But you know, I wish more people <laughs> would would do what you were doing, which is drinking life in and, <laughs> you know, just observing. There is too much expression and no experience. Yes, you're absolutely <laughs> right. And what do you say to people who, <laughs> who, who need to listen, who need to drink life in a little bit more? Human experience happens from within. Pain and pleasure is generated from within us. Joy and misery generated from within us. Agony and ecstasy generated from within us. But we are thinking something else is doing it to us. So the more and more I looked at it, I understood the mechanics of how what we call as human functions from its very core of non-physical dimension to the physicality of who we are. As I observed it more and more, 
I realized various things. One day I was like around seventeen or eighteen at that time. Food was... Uh, uh, no, I don't call this a eating problem, but I ate a lot. I never put on any weight because I was so intensely active all the time physically active in sport, in climbing rocks, riding motorcycles, or b at that time I was riding a bicycle endlessly. So one day I put my... a morsel of food in my mouth and it exploded in my mouth. I suddenly realized something that is not me, coming from somewhere, suddenly is becoming me. Within my mouth, not even... it didn't even go into my stomach, right here, it's just becoming me. That's how it's happened, isn't it? It just hit me so hard. Suddenly, I started eating slow because... not by choice, not by wanting to be slow, suddenly the experience of eating became like the greatest thing because something that's not me, it is no more about taste, it is about something that's not you, is becoming you. This is the greatest love affair happening within myself. Mm. It just exploded. Like this, it went on and uh, by then, uh, I had become a super skeptic about everything. Skeptical about social situations, moralities in the world, uh, religion, politics, economics. I'm super skeptical about everything. Then I started a few businesses because I was crisscrossing India on my motorcycle. Then they stopped me at the borders. I was nearly twenty, but I did not know there is something called as a passport, you know, that's another generation. They stopped me and said, uh, where is your passport? I pulled out my driving license because I've been riding since I was twelve without a license. By the time I got eighteen, within three months, I got my first driving license. Well, I thought my driving license is like, will take me anywhere in the world. These guys stopped me at the border and said, this is not going anywhere, you need a passport. So, I did not know what it is, where to get it from, I came back, figured it out. Within six months, I got a passport because I thought I'm going to just ride away across the world. Then I knew I need some money, so I started a business, I started a farm. I built a few farms for others, then I got into construction, became far more successful than people would normally think you would happen... would happen in a short period of time because I'm... I'm like eighteen, twenty hours a day non-stop. Okay? <laughs> Others work eight hours a day and they stop in between, they have to smoke, they have to drink, they have to eat, they have to rest. <laughs> I have no such issues, I'm like on. So naturally, everything worked. And uh, my mother started saying, oh, you know, somebody told me that when you were born, that you will live a very fortunate life. I said, I'm the one who is working my ass off and you telling me somebody told you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody told you I'm fortunate. <laughs> Do you know all the circus I'm going through? Yes. To produce results on the surface. Do you know all the circus that happens inside? Yes, I do know that feeling. I felt... <laughs> I, I actually had an experience where I went to a church convention and... when I was younger and someone had prophesied over me and said the same thing. And now I kind of feel the same way. I mean, <laughs> I'm working so much. <laughs> Thank you. And, and it, it is a privilege, but it is hard work, isn't it? It depends. If you do it joyfully, True. it's exciting. If you do it miserably, it's hard. Yeah. No work is hard unless you make it that way. Would you say that changing your perception is the key? See, if you're joyful, you will swim up and down twenty-five times. Well, is it hard on your muscles? Yes, it is. But is it hard? No. Is it hard work? No, it's joy. So you climb a mountain, is it hard? Yes, your knees will freak, but you're accelerated. So how can you call it hard work? If you're doing something that you don't love to do, then only you can do hard work. Hard work, you must leave it for donkeys. Because donkeys are always made to do what they don't like to do, unfortunately, poor animals. How do you encourage someone to find the joy in their life, and specifically their career? Because if they do find that it's hard work, how do you help them shift their... <laughs> See, somebody was telling me that it seems some studies are showing, 
Seventy percent of the Americans hate their work, hate, not dislike, hate. If you're doing something that you hate for five days of the week, of course in the weekend you will overdose. You should not do that because this life is not about you making it hard and then in the end having fun. This is not what this life is about. We live in this world that teaches us that we have to work, 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 paycheck to paycheck and then someday we'll have a happy... No, it's ending. not about paycheck to paycheck. Right from kindergarten level, um, always you must be ahead of everybody else. So because your only joy is in other people's failures, if we do not change this, humanity will never find joy. Above all, nobody will find joy in their work, there is no such thing. Because both joy and misery can only happen within you. The seat of your experience is within you, it's not out there. So it doesn't matter if you sweep the floor or you are a rock star or I'm a spiritual teacher, it doesn't matter. You can do everything joyfully if you're joyful. Work is not joyful, activity is not joyful, nothing is joyful, only you can be joyful. If you are joyful, everything that you do will be like that. Now, I'm not driving a Mercedes or a Ferrari, I'm driving a truck, but I'm joyful <laughs> I'm driving a truck, boom, boom, diesel. Is that what is parked outside? Yes. <laughs> wow, I have to go take a look at it. Yes, I'm you so must excited. See <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you, you know, you in your bio, it, you are an Indian author, a yogi, a mystic, and a visionary. Can you describe what a mystic is for people who may not know? <laughs> see, there are only two kinds of people. This happened uh, some time ago. Uh, you know, the books, till now, most of… I've published about 123 books. So, most of these books are just compilation of my talks. Somebody transcribes it and puts it, I never bother to read it, usually I give it a title. Amazing. Only these last three books, Inner Engineering, Death and now the Karma, these three books, I've sat on it and worked a little bit on it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they're just talks, people compile and put it on. Mm -hmm. So, this particular thing came to me, I just flipped through and uh, then I wrote the title of the book, Of Mystics and Mistakes. Then our English publication department, uh, because we publish in various languages, uh, came back and said, Sadhguru, this is too much up in the face, you can't just say of mystics and mistakes. I said, see, there are only two kinds of people in the world, mystics and mistakes. <laughs> wow. Those who have made a mistake with their perception, they are mistakes. So much suffering happens because of that. If you perceive everything right, people will call you a mystic. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody could be a mystic. Of course. Wow. I love if it that is, thing. if it is uh, so unattainable, that means uh, I must be some kind of a alien. Okay, so I do have to ask. Speaking of aliens, do you believe in extraterrestrial beings? Well, I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> A part of the reason why I work so much on my consciousness is so that I can make contact with <laughs> beings from another, you know, from other dimensions. See, uh, because you're using the word consciousness, let me say this. So there are many aspects to who you are right now. There is a body, physical body, which is an accumulation. The food that we've eaten has consolidated itself like this. There is a mental body, mind is not just here, it's across the body. Every cell in the body has its own intelligence and enormous amount of memory, isn't it? Every cell in your body remembers trillion times more than what your conscious mind can remember because it remembers your forefathers. Your cells must be having some trouble because of so many different origins. <laughs> <laughs> but still, your body is not confused. It remembers perfectly well, exactly. Confusion can happen in your head, but no cell in your body is confused. 
all that memory is perfectly preserved, isn't it? The imprints of million years. So there is a mental body, we call this manomaya kosha, that means there's a whole mental body. So this is hardware, that is software. <laughs> you may have good hardware, you may have good software, but if you don't plug it into quality power, both these things are as good as stones, isn't it? So the third dimension is referred to as pranamaya kosha or the energy body, there's an underlying energy body. So the whole work of yoga is to handle the energy body in such a way, because if your energy body is done in a certain way, your physical and mental body will only be a reflection of that. If there are no problems in your energy body, there shall be no problems in your physical or your mental bodies. Right now, the problem with the modern world is this, they're trying to fix the physical body, they're trying to fix the mental body, no any kind of thing with the energetic system. Mm -hmm. So these three are physical in nature. Physical body is absolutely physical, even mental body is physical, even energy body is physical, but a very subtle physicality. The next dimension of your body is called as Vigyanamaya Kosha, that means it's a transitory body. It is not a body that you can perceive with five senses. See, anything that's physical, you can perceive by seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. Anything that's not physical, you cannot see it, you cannot touch it, you cannot feel it, you cannot smell it, you cannot hear it. So that's why even if it's right here, you will not know it. That doesn't mean there is nothing here, there are a whole lot of stuff here, but you don't feel it because these five senses are no use for those purposes. These five senses are wonderful for survival. It gives you a picture. If your eyes did not work, you would walk into the water, all right <laughs> Not walk upon the water like you were expecting me to do. <laughs> I was hoping you still will <laughs> <laughs> Because if I… I can walk on the water, but then where shall I swim? I won't do such a foolish thing <laughs> So, the fourth dimension is transitory, it's called Vijnanamaya Kosha. Transitory means from physical, it's becoming non-physical. The fifth dimension of your body is called Anandamaya Kosha, it is purely non-physical in nature. If something is non-physical, how would you define it? I don't know that I could. You cannot, because only if there is some kind of, you know, mm -hmm. boundary, you can define, you can say, oh, this is a woman, this is a man, this is a house, because there is a boundary. If there is no boundary, how do you define it? There is no definition. So, there is no definition, there is no way to describe it. Because of that, we speak of it from our experience. So, we call it Anandamaya Kosha, which means the bliss body. This doesn't mean a bubble of bliss is sitting within you. It's non-physical in nature, but whenever we touch it, we become blissful. Because of that, like a ch it's a child's language, in a, you know, in America it's in use, for example, these are speakers, but you know, some time ago, people would be carrying big uh, tape recorders on their shoulders, listening to the music when there were no headphones and stuff. They called it a boombox. Yes. Okay <laughs> Because it's… it's a child's language, it's doing boom, boom, so it's a boombox. <laughs> yes. So, because whenever we touch this, we become blissful, so it's the bliss body, because we don't know how to define it. Mm. Something that's non-physical, not only doesn't have a boundary, also doesn't have a quantity, isn't it? Right. So, as we sit here, this is my body, that's your body. This is my mind, that's your mind. They will never be one. That is your body, this is my body. Till they bury us, we are not going to be one. I would love to ask you about your relationship with motorcycles <laughs> because I find this so fascinating. I, it's not every day that you see um, a yogi on a motorcycle <laughs> and, and then finding practices, you know, or, or learning valuable lessons through it. What drew you to motorcycles and what did you learn from it? I started riding small scooters and motorcycles when I was twelve. Yes. It was not legal, but still, it is not motorcycle per se, 
if you were walking, you could cover only that much terrain. If you were on a motorcycle, it took you away. Like I was just saying, it's not about freedom, it's about the ropes. So legs were ropes, so bicycle became freedom. Once you saw a motorized bicycle, naturally, you went for that, <laughs> all right? right. right. <laughs> so as I said, I crisscrossed India on my motorcycle at that time. But after that, things happened when I was twenty-five, this whole thing exploded, my myth of who I am, my individuality exploded and completely I lost everything. One afternoon, I went up the hill, a small hill in Mysore. Are you familiar with India? No. No. You should come. Well, I have been, but I didn't get to spend too much time there. There is a city called Mysore in the south. So that's where I grew up. So there's a small hill. Generally, this is the thing there, at least at that time, the tradition in the hilly in Mysore city is. If you... Uh, if you want to test our motorcycles, of course, we go up Chamundi Hill. If you want to camp, we go up Chamundi Hill. If you want to party, we go up Chamundi Hill. If we fall in love, we go up Chamundi Hill. If we fall out, we have to go up Chamundi Hill. If you have nothing to do, you go up Chamundi Hill. So one afternoon, between two business meetings, I had nothing to do. So not even thinking about it, I just rode up Chamundi Hill, parked my motorcycle, went up and sat on a rock that was familiar to me. Suddenly, for the first time, I did not know really who... what is me and what is not me. What was me was just all over the place. And I couldn't figure out what's happening to me. And I was... every cell in my body was dripping ecstasy, bursting with ecstasy. I don't know what was happening to me, I thought this lasted for ten, fifteen minutes, but when I came back to my normal senses, it was about four and a half hours. I was sitting right there, eyes open. It was three-thirty in the afternoon when I sat there, sun had set, it had become dark. But for the first time in my adult life, tears, me and tears were impossible. I live like this, but tears to a point my shirt is all wet. So when I ask my super skeptical mind, what is happening to me? The only thing that my mind could tell me is, maybe you're going off your rocker. But within myself, I knew I've hit a gold mine. I don't know what it is, but I knew this is not something to be lost. So when I shared with my closest friends that something like this is happening to me, but just close my eyes, I'm just gone. Hey, come on, what did you drink? Come on, what did you pop? Where did you get it? <laughs> well, this is all I got. So suddenly I realized there was no context in the society around me as to what was happening to me. Nobody knew what was happening to me. People, my family started looking at me with some concern because suddenly, you know, the shape of my face was changing, my eyes changed, my voice changed. Within matter of three, four weeks, my gait changed. Even if I tried to walk the way I was walking earlier, I couldn't walk. Suddenly my gait changed, everything changed. And lifetimes of memory just descended on me in such a way that it became a bit challenging to be with the people who were around me, my family, my friends, my work. I was... by then, within five years, I was known as a very successful entrepreneur having half a dozen businesses going. I just couldn't go there anymore. I went there one day and I just sat there for some negotiation. Then I saw whatever I think, all these guys are agreeing to me, even though it's not good for them. That's the day I decided I will never sit for any negotiation ever. Even now, even for the yoga center, so much land is being bought, sold, whatever happening, I never sit for any negotiation because if I think something, they will do just that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I said, I'll never again sit in a business deal, ever. I've not done that till now and I will not do it. So, I just stepped out of my business and traveled around for about a year, year and a half, trying to check out what was coming in my memory, lifetimes of memory. So, I traveled just to check if it's true. Though in my mind it was crystal clear, 
I was such a skeptic, I was trying to somehow prove it wrong. But every bit that I saw was there, I traveled thousands of kilometers across of India, trying to identify those places. After that, there's been no looking back uh, the last thirty-nine years. At that time, I sat down after about maybe a year or maybe a few months. I thought, see, this is fantastic. If I simply sit here and don't mess with my mind, I'm ecstatic, bursting. And I knew this is true with everybody. I tried with a few people and it worked. Then I made a plan. In two and a half years' time, at that time the world's population was 5.6 billion people. In two and a half years' time, I will make the entire humanity ecstatic. I've invented… I've discovered this. Thirty-nine years now <laughs> Been working seven days of the week, three hundred and sixty-five days, over sixteen to eighteen hours a day. Here I am. People say we have touched over a billion people today. But a billion is not the world. World has become nearly eight billion now. So, I'm just telling you my sob story, I will die <laughs> a failure, <laughs> but a blissful failure <laughs> <laughs> I… I don't think that you will be dying a failure, if it's any consolation <laughs> So, my podcast is called 4D with Demi Lovato. <laughs> <laughs> For don't say 4D and all, because there's a whole bunch of idiots back in the India, who have some problem with the word dimension, they think I use it too many times. What they don't understand is that in my life, I constantly live multiple dimensions within myself. So now that you are also 4D, just for them so that because they always feed on this one word and, you know, say ugly, nasty things about me so that they are also happy, I will say it 4D means dimension, 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 dimension. <laughs> So that all the idiots are happy. Yes! <laughs> I guess I don't need to explain to you what 4D means. Any fool who thinks that what I do not know cannot exist is a bloody fool, mm -hmm. okay? So you might not have experienced the fourth dimension, but you know there is something beyond what you know that's very important. Yes, exactly. So that's 4D. Yes, and… and… okay, you said it perfect. I'm saying for all those people who might not have experienced anything beyond what they see, what they hear, what they smell, what they taste and touch, essentially sense organs, do not ever think that what you do not know cannot exist. That is the crown of ignorance. Ignorance is there, ignorance is not bad as long as you know you're ignorant. Yes. When I know that I do not know, I am… my intelligence is constantly seeking. You cannot help it. It's not a choice, I am going to become a seeker. There's no such thing. If you realize you do not know, everything within you will start seeking. So, you will destroy your seeking the moment you think, what I do not know cannot exist in this world. So, it's good. If you are in fourth dimension, if you are in three dimensions, you must talk about the fourth dimension. If you are in fourth dimension, you must talk about the five, fifth dimension. When I say talk about, you are not talking about something that you do not know. At least you are addressing there is something more than what I know. And that's very important. That is an acknowledgement of the limitations of what I know, so that always there is a seeking that your seeking never sleep, your intelligence never sleeps, your body may sleep because it needs sleep, but your intelligence, your consciousness, your seeking need not sleep. Eight hours a day seeking is not going to work. You need twenty-four hours all your life, you're seeking, otherwise your life will become very small. Most people are not even in three dimensions, they become just one. Their thought and their emotion is everything. Yes. <laughs> what do you say to people who… who want to help shift those people out of their first dimension views? Right now, uh, I've… Uh, you know, like, this is not… Uh, I don't know how to 
name it because whichever way you say it, people will think it's one kind of description. We have launched what is called as conscious planet. I'm seeing how people who have influence in the world can own it and take it on, because the idea is just this. One, there is something about human consciousness. Another, there is an ecological situation which needs urgent attention. All this talk about meditation, consciousness, spirituality, seeking, all this is only meaningful if we make sure there is life on this planet for the next few centuries or millennia. Right now, that's in serious threat. In the last fifty years, more than sixty percent of the vertebrate po population is gone. Eighty percent of the biomass insects are gone in the last thirty years. They're saying by twenty, twenty, you know, this uh, twenty-first century ends, they're expecting more than fifty percent of insect species will be gone. This means there is a serious threat to life. When I say serious threat to life, See, there is substantial evidence to show that if all the worms disappear right now, life on this planet, including you and me, will end in not more than eighteen months. If all the insects disappear, life on this planet will end in four and a half to six years. If all the microbes disappear, it will end right now, right now. But if all of us disappear, human beings, <laughs> land will flourish, life will flourish on this planet. So this unnecessary level of significance that we have attached to ourselves and our existence needs to go down a little bit. Our love for life needs to go beyond our species. This is very, very important. This is yoga. Yoga means union, that you experience everything as a part of yourself. If this experience doesn't happen to more and more people, Especially if this experience doesn't happen to people who hold responsible positions in the world, we as a generation will be opening up a threshold of destruction which is very difficult to turn back. I am deeply involved in this, I have been in touch with various scientists, uh, United Nations organizations. Everywhere it's very clear that if we do something significant to turn this back in the next fifteen to twenty years, things will turn around in forty to sixty years' time. But if you let it go, these twenty years, go business as usual, then if you try to turn it back, it may take two hundred years to turn it back. So right now, either we correct this consciously or nature will correct it in a very cruel way. Lot of people are already environmentalists, not virologists, environmentalists have started talking and saying the present pandemic also is one of the outcomes of this environmental disaster that we are unleashing upon ourselves. So conscious planet is… because as I see, there is really no problem on this planet. There is only one problem, the human being. There is no other problem. If you fix you and me, yes. it's a done thing. But to make everybody willing, as I said, last thirty-nine years, I thought, who would refuse to be ecstatic? Who would not want to be blissful? But people are so deeply invested in their miseries <laughs> how much ever you do, they hang on to their miseries. This is because still life is compulsive, it's not become conscious. A human being so we don't call, refer to any other creature as a being, only to this one, because this is supposed to know how to be. If you know how to be, what is the problem? There's absolutely no problem with this. Mm. Well, I think that I have to end it there because that was actually my favorite thing that I heard you say. And I want all of you, people like you, young people who have influence over the next generation, to take up this conscious planet. This is not my organization, mm -hmm. this is not my business. I think this is the business of this generation to create conscious human beings and in turn create a conscious planet so that we will leave something that we are proud of for the next generation. Otherwise, we are uh, leaving it like a disaster. We are leaving the world like it's been ravaged by war. We call this business.
Mm. Business, yes. Uh, do you have any last words of wisdom for my audience? I'm going to live for some more time. Why do you want me to tell the last words right now? <laughs> <laughs> You're right, you have a very good point. <laughs> Never mind, we'll have you back another time. My beard may be gray, but I'm, I'm living for some more time. Jenny. Yes, you are, yes, you are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.